I was a bachelor until about 20, uh, 24. And then when I got married in uh, uh, June of 2004, we don't, I don't know, was I over? I don't know, sorry. Then when I got married, uh, I had to think after that on six twenty five oh four, I had to figure out how now shall I live as a married person. It changed everything about how I did life. No longer could I just go to the store and buy tuna cans and relish and survive for weeks on end. It changed completely how we shopped. No longer could I just spend my money as I wanted because it was now our money that we had to, 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 to spend together. No longer could I be uh, okay with blinds that were dirty and broken in my apartment, but how now shall I live is by calling my landlord and asking those to be replaced because I am now married. Marriage changed everything about how I live. When we had our first child, if you have kids, you know how now shall you live. It, it changes everything. Uh, you have to increase the amount of coffee in your house because you're not sleeping as much. You have to think through, if you want to go on a trip, on how much stuff you have to bring with you. How now shall you live changes. You have to think through that. All right, how, how do I go about this? What used to be a, 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 a task that I did one way for a number of years, now I have to live a completely different way. Um, and if those, both of those illustrations don't resonate with you, that's what's been going on since the pandemic, right? How now shall we live amidst COVID? How now shall I uh, shake somebody's bump somebody? How do I bow? How do you greet somebody? How now shall I go to work? Do I zoom in? Do I call in? Do I uh, like? How now should I uh, do life? I mean, here's a picture of us at, at Faith. This is what it looks like to do life amidst the pandemic. If you're on a board or leadership of Faith, like you're just like. Isn't that what life is like? How now should we do ministry? It's like, all right, well, you used to be able to back up. Nope. Change, turn, pivot. I mean, this is, how now should we do life? This is like completely different. Everything changes. Nothing works easy. So it, life, the pandemic has changed how we live, how we do life, how we do ministry. Well, in the book of Ephesians, Paul has taken us to the mountaintop. He's taken us there on, uh, on God's sovereignty and God's goodness. He's talked about the redemption that we have through Jesus Christ. He's talked about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He's talked about the power of the cross to take those who are far and those who are near and to bring them together. He talked about the power of the cross to kill the hostility and how unity is now a witness to the watching world, to the principalities and the powers. He's talked about the power of God who's able to do more than we could ever hope or imagine. He's talked about the love of God and the depth of it and the breadth of it and the width of it and that we should be strengthened by it and filled with it. And then he gets down to the nitty gritty. He comes down from the mountaintop, down to our everyday life, and he says, this is now how you shall live. And last week we talked about how we live as a church uh, body together, what that looks like. And now today he talks about what it like, looks like in our everyday life, how now we should live. And Paul begins by saying in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, that we should no longer live like the Gentiles live. If you turn to me in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4, 17 uh, through 20 to begin with. Paul says, now I say this, and I testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and they have given themselves up to sensuality, to greed, to practice, to every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you have learned Christ. Paul is saying to, that we should no longer live as Gentiles live. That is no longer how we are to live, to, to live without hope of God. 
to live without understanding that God is now with us, to live with, to, 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 we are to live a different way. And it's quite shocking that Paul says to the, to the church at Ephesus and likely to the churches around them that they are not to live as Gentiles live because they were Gentiles. That's like Paul saying to us today, to paraphrase it, that we are no longer to live as Americans. That we are no longer to live as seniors at, or at high school students at Armstrong. That we are no longer to live as elementary students at Loring Elementary. That we are no longer to live defined by what used to define us. That we are to live completely different lives than the rest of the Americans, the rest of the high school students at Armstrong, the rest of the elementary students at, at Loring. That our lives are not to be lived anymore as if there is no God. We are not to be shaped first and foremost that because we are Gentiles or Americans or Republicans or at high school or in college, but our primary thing that is to shape us is that we have learned Christ, that we are now Christians. That is to shape now how we live. For we have learned Christ, Paul says. That is, if you've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've encountered the risen Christ. You've encountered his, his life. You've experienced the power of his death and resurrection. You now know him. And because you've encountered him, it changes every part of your life. You can no longer just live like the rest of the Gentiles. You no longer can live like the rest of Americans. You no longer can live like the rest of the students at your high school or your elementary school or your college or the rest of those who are retired because something has changed in your life. And this is not just a little something. This is a dramatic transformation because you have encountered God the Son, the risen Jesus Christ. You've encountered His love and His grace. And Paul is saying, so therefore, consider now how you live. Live differently. And Paul goes on. He says, assuming, verse 21, assuming that you have heard about Jesus and you were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through sins, deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul is saying that we don't, we're not just to call, change our behavior in a way of morality, or just to, to do things differently, but Paul is saying you are different. You have been changed. You have been healed. You have been set free. So therefore, live that out. Jesus said, repent and believe in me. Return from your old way of living and live a new life. Paul's talking about this old self and the, the new self. This new self is this transformation from within because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Our hearts of stone have been replaced with hearts of flesh. We have the Spirit now in us. We no longer have to live the way we used to live without hope, without, uh, with hardness of heart, being callous and greedy. We used to live without God. Now we have God at work in us. And so we are to live this different way of life. And Paul says, think of how now you should live. It's like, has anybody here broken an arm before? Or a leg? Yeah. yeah. Or if you've broken an arm or a leg, you know what that entails to get that cast on. And you can't use that arm or that leg, and so you have to relearn how you write, or relearn, you, you walk now with crutches and a limp. But after a number of months, you go back into the doctor, and she says, you know, you've been healed, your bones have grown back, and, and they're strong again. 
And if you're a kid, it's amazing how God has designed a body that if you're a kid, oftentimes your bones are stronger now after you break them. That doesn't happen anymore for adults, but kids, because of the way their bodies grow, sometimes it's even stronger. And so the doctor says, you're healed, you can take that cast off, but what happens when that cast is off? What happens when your leg is no longer in that, in that wrap anymore? You can, you can walk like you should, but what happens? You still limp, right? Because you've spent so much of your life or the last few months writing with your left hand or walking with a limp that it's hard to remember. Wait a second. These bones will hold me up now. These, these, these bones now work. And Paul is saying to Christians, you might have spent the last 22 years of your life living one way. Living for yourself living for pride, living as if God didn't exist. But now, you've learned Christ. Christ is at work in you. So you don't have to live like that anymore. Now, live a different way. Put off that old self of greed and pride and selfishness. Now walk in that newness of life because you've been healed. Your heart is now alive. You're now in communion with God so you can walk without that limb. You can use your hand to write again. You have strength to be able to do this because the God of all love has poured out His love in your heart. The God Spirit is at work within you. You have access. You walk with the living God so you can put off the old and walk in that newness of life. And then Paul brings it down to the everyday. I think as Christians, it's often easy to talk about changing the world or changing the nation or changing our school or changing our community. It's these big pictures. And God, we prayed earlier, God, God calls us to pray that His kingdom would come on, heaven as in, in, on earth as it is in heaven. That we are to pray these big prayers and have these big dreams I mean, God was able to do more than we could hope or imagine. And yet, what is hard for us as Christians is to live this experience out in our day-to-day -day life. Where He has us, in the relationships He's given us, in the practical, in the everyday. And that's what Paul talks about now. He gives us six examples of how we live out the gospel. Verse 25, Paul says, you, have, you can live a newness of life. You have the gospel. You have God. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now, we could spend uh, a, whole, a whole day studying that. But what Paul is saying is he saying, you now know the God of all truth. Jesus is the way and the life and the truth. And Jesus knows what you've done. He knows how you've fallen short. And he has loved you anyway. Your identity as a son, as a daughter of the king is now secure. So you no longer have to live in falsehood. Trying to puff yourself up or put yourself on a pedestal or, 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 or put yourself together in a way greater than who you truly are. You know how long you have to lie to get ahead? Why do you need to get ahead? You've been seated with Christ with all the heavenly riches. You no longer have to live with this falsehood. You can live in humble truth. That's what Paul's saying. You see how the gospel changes how we live? Uh, verse uh, 26, he says, now, we, now to live with, you can be angry, but do not sin. Do not let that sun go down on your anger. So much of this world, and you've seen this during the political season, live based on anger and hate and, and, and wrath. and they're, they're, they're just, It just fuels other anger and other darkness. But God says, you are now a child of the King. So you can live differently. You can say no to letting anger control you. You can be frustrated with injustice and uh, uh, oppression. And you can, uh, you can experience that, uh, 
when there's frustration or pain, but do not be controlled by that. Instead, you're a Christian, so be controlled by what? By love. Do you see how this changes how we speak, how we act? This is what Martin Luther King is saying about, um, about hate and anger. He says, returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Adding deeper darkness to a night already divided, devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out hate. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And who can love? Christians can love. Because we know Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself up for us. And so now we can walk a life of love. Paul goes on, uh, I think what a, a beautiful picture of the gospel, verse 28. He says, now then, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he, he may have something to share with anyone in need. So what Paul is doing is he's helping us think through the gospel. And he gives us a number of different examples after that that we won't delve into. But this one, I think, is a great example of thinking and living a new way. Because if you're a thief in this world today, as a Gentile thief or now an American thief, you can be persuaded by morality to stop thieving, to stop stealing, right? Don't steal anymore. There are cameras out there now. Don't steal anymore. There are consequences to your actions. There's a criminal justice system. And so if you steal and get caught, there's consequences to do that. So we could tell people not to steal because of the consequences or the punishment. And oftentimes we've been brought up like that with our parents or we parent like that. Don't do this or you'll get punished. But that's not the gospel. And then Paul said, and then it, well, sometimes we say, well, it's because of the reward. Don't steal because you can be rewarded for good labor. It's the reward and punishment. It's punishment and reward. The parents say, well, if you do this, you'll get rewarded with this. Or and nowadays, it's like, well, work a good job, and then you'll be able to have a house, perhaps, or a car. Or I met somebody last year who lives in Chicago and uh, owns a business, a manufacturing business, and the way, what he does to get his employees he goes around and he talks to drug dealers in his neighborhood and he brings a piece of paper out and he has a conversation with them and he says, how much do you make as a drug dealer? And they say, oh, I make this much. I, you know, I make a lot of money. And he goes, really? But how much do you pay for protection? How much do you pay for this person and that person? And, and it breaks it down to how many hours a week you work and he comes up with this number and he shows, he says, this is what you work for per hour. He says, come work for me. And I'll give you, you know, $18 an hour to work in this manufacturing plant. And he persuades people to change based on the reward. And I think that's good and that's fitting. But that's not the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel goes all the way and it says, we should no longer, the thief should no longer steal, but they should do their own labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that why? Why should the thief live differently? So that they can contribute to those in need. Do you see the gospel? The gospel changes us from selfish, greedy individuals to those who desire to work so that we can give to others. So that we can be a blessing to others. Because we have been blessed by God. See? Everything we say, everything we do, all our actions need to be thought through differently because we are Christians and we can all live differently. And Paul summarizes this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. He says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, God is in our everyday walks. Jim, Mar Jim Elliot, the, the famous missionary martyr, wrote that he sought the God in the commonplace. And I found him every day. Not in the streets of Jerusalem or caressed by Godly Spray, but I found God on the sidewalks, the backyard, and our upstairs. When I walked with him on Main Street, he handled my school affairs. 
My Christ stands not in a synagogue with a beard and a long white gown, but I know him in the grocery store. He rides our car downtown. Maybe smile when I tell him some say it is not right to find the Lord on Broadway, neath the glow of a neon light. What Jim is saying there is he knows the God in every day. He walks with God in the backyard and upstairs at the grocery store, at Armstrong, at Lori, in our everyday life. And as everyday Christians, we are to live differently. If you look at the tracks of different animals, or tracks in the snow or in the dirt, you can figure out what animals made of them. Those big Big prints, you can figure out, oh, that's a bear or a bobcat, or if you're in Africa, that's the, the track of a, an elephant. You can tell if it's something that slithers or something that has landed and walks a little bit and then takes off. You can even tell by the tracks if the animal is running because of the force of the print, or if it's uh, uh, trying to retreat or turn around or readjust. You can figure out what's going on by the tracks. Friends, what kind of tracks are you leaving? What kind of tracks are you leaving? What do people see? Because if you've been changed by the gospel, Ephesians 5, 1 to 2, you are to leave tracks of what? Tracks of love. Because Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Excuse me. Sacrifice to God. How now shall we live as followers of Jesus Christ? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've given us through the gospel. We thank you that we can now live a new life. Lord, as we take communion now, Lord, I pray that you would remind us of the power of the gospel. Remind us of the presence of Jesus Christ. Remind us of this is where it gets practical that we are sinners in need of a great Savior. And then we take the bread and the cup together in the body. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.